I'm Ashley. I'm Jen. And I'm Sarah. And we are Unabridged, the podcast where teachers take on books. Join us each week for bookish episodes and check out our website, unabridgedpod.com, where you can find lots of new bookish content every week. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Unabridged Pod and message us there or see our website to get plugged into the Unabridged community. You want opinions about books? We've got them. Hi, and welcome to Unabridged. This is episode 206. Today we are discussing winter and holiday reads. So we want to help you get into the season here at the start of December with some winter and holiday read picks. Before we get into sharing those recs and also our bookish check-in, I wanted to remind you that we have a very active blog on our website at unabridgedpod.com. Every Monday, we have bookish faves where we curate lists of different topics and then books that we love related to those. So we're always giving lots of recommendations there. On Tuesdays, we enjoy doing pub day shout outs. So we go through all of the books that are coming out every week, and then we select some to share with you and to promote as ones that we know that we're excited to read. And then on Fridays, we have book reviews. So every week we have that coming at you. We also have a lot of great bookish content on our site and we have our show notes and our teaching tidbits show notes. So it's just a great place to get plugged in. We also have information there about our ambassadors program, about our reading challenge. So if you haven't checked out our website before, just go to unabridgedpod.com and there are so many things that you can find out there about ways to be more plugged into the unabridged community. And again, unabridgedpod.com, you also can sign up there if you are interested in getting reminders when we do blog posts or if you want to subscribe to our newsletter, you can do all that there. So we want to start off today with our bookish check-in like we do every episode. Sarah, what are you reading? Well, you know how I love this episode for winter and holiday reads. <laughs> so I was I was like, this is the perfect chance to double dip. So <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm reading is Melissa De La Cruz's Pride, Prejudice, and Mistletoe. And I wanted to read this because, you know, earlier this year, I read Pride and Prejudice. And then we read Pride, Prejudice, and other flavors for the podcast. And then, so I was like, I would, I would like to read an adaptation that is based on the holidays. So I chose this and it's I chose it for many reasons. One, because I had I had read the source material. Two, because it's very short, <laughs> and I just need something I can fly through during this busy season. So this is like again based on Pride and Prejudice. The main character is Darcy, and it's a girl. So it's a like this gender switched retelling, and she is very busy and she's successful. And then her mom gets ill and she has to go home to help take care of her in Pemberley, Ohio. <laughs> so when she gets back there, she is re you've reunited with an old neighbor named Luke Bennett. You know how that goes on from there. And I will say this book has been adapted into a Hallmark movie. So I feel like I know where it's going to go and how it's going to end. But during this season, I am very happy to read a nice comfy read that I know is going to end well and all things are going to be solved at the end. So I'm fine with that. But <laughs> and this has been on my shelf for a long time and I just thought what a perfect time to break it out. So that is Melissa De La Cruz's Pride, Prejudice and Mistletoe. Oh, I love that, Sarah. I've really enjoyed some of the retellings lately and, and reading those. And I also have wanted to try Melissa De La Cruz's books. I've heard great things about her. And yeah, so maybe I can squeeze that in this month before yeah. the holiday season is over. <laughs> we'll see. What about you, Jen? What are you reading? So this is going to be a total tone switch. <laughs> I was going to say, I see what Jen's book is titled. And I'm like, oh. Not a okay, holiday so just book. <laughs> get ready for this ride. Okay, so this is Less Pains, The Dead Are Arising, and it is about Malcolm X. So in 1990, Les Payne started interviewing all of Malcolm X's living siblings, and it's it's the story of his life. I am listening to this one thanks to Libra FM, and it is a long, it's almost 20-hour audiobook, but it is 
fascinating. So I read the autobiography of Malcolm X. It's been a while. And then I did watch the Spike Lee adaptation that was based on the autobiography. So I definitely feel like I have a sense of Malcolm X's life from his perspective. But it's really fascinating just to get this sense of more background, more historical context. And then, of course, as we know, memories are funny and memoirs are curated things. Autobiographies are curated things. So there are a number of places where Les Payne will say, so this is what Malcolm X said in his autobiography, but this is what his siblings said, or he left this part out. And so, yeah, it's really fascinating. I just feel like it's a life I have not visited the story of in a while. And it's really well done. It is great on audio. The narrator, I'll put the name in the show notes. I can't remember right now what the narrator's name is, but is doing a great job. Malcolm X's arc is compelling. And to see that through not only his own eyes, but the eyes of those who knew him is really great. So again... <laughs> This does not scream holiday or winter read to anyone, but I do recommend it perhaps at another time of the year. (laughs) Yeah, Ashley. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that when that one came through on Libro FM, I was like, oh, my gosh, I've got to listen to that because it just looks phenomenal. And it is the length is a little bit daunting, but I do really want to get to it soon. It's well worth listening to. Ashley, what are you reading? Well, this one is also thanks to Libro FM and their ALC program. I could not wait to read Helen Huang's latest book. I have said many times how much I love her romances and how in a lot of ways they were the thing that led me into reading romance. So we've talked before about authors who, when we read the book, it really like opened a doorway into something we hadn't experienced before. And that was definitely true for me with The Bride Test is what I read first. And then I've also read The Kiss Quotient. I love her books. And so I'm really excited to read The Heart Principle. So that is the one that just came out in the fall. And it is about, so Kai was one of the two main characters in The Bride Test, Kai Deep, and his brother is Quan. And this one, I have only just started. So actually, Anna is the opening narrator in it. So I haven't seen Quan yet, but I know that he is the connecting part. You know, these are stories that are companion books. And so there's some connection to the characters in the different ones. But in the opening part, Anna is, we see her struggling with, she has all these timers set and she is relentless about making sure that she adheres to the timers because she is in this cycle of she rehearses and she plays the violin, but she rehearses so obsessively that if she doesn't have timers to dictate her life, then she doesn't eat, she doesn't remember to go to appointments and things like that. So right in the beginning, we see that she's in this cycle of needing these timers, she has a therapy appointment that she's going to, and she begrudges going but knows that she needs to do it is kind of where she is on that journey. You can see right away that she's struggling with her music. And she's struggling with managing her life. And she just feels like she cannot get through this piece. She's really stuck in a loop kind of in this piece that she's been practicing. So you can tell that she's really accomplished, but that she's not playing with the orchestra right now because she's working through the struggle. And that that's like her whole life right now is that she cannot get past what is blocking her with the piece. And that's what she's working on with the therapist. But right in the beginning in the opening scene, we see that when she goes to therapy, that she is so preoccupied with trying to say the right thing, do the right thing, make the therapist feel happy, that she's reading all the reactions. She's trying to make sure she knocks at just the right time, that she looks at just the right place on the therapist's face. And so you can see that she's expending a lot of energy into trying to modify her behavior to act like what she, you know, considers to be the social norms. And I am fascinated by that. I think that part of what I love about Helen Huang's work is that she really explores what it is like to be on the spectrum and how draining that can be for people who are aware that they might think or act differently and are trying so hard to please other people. So we see that, that like Anna is having this one struggle that's related to music, but she also is expending a lot of energy 
in just like kind of her daily tasks and that those are costing her a lot. And so I am captivated right away and I'm I'm definitely here for everything that Helen Huang writes. I just find her fascinating. I think that she also explores women on the spectrum, some, and I think that that's really interesting to see portrayed in the book. And then I have loved her other romances and I love Quan, so I'm excited to see him come into the story. So again, that's Helen Huang's The Heart Principle, and that is a new release from this past fall. I cannot wait to read that one. I haven't gotten to it yet, but <laughs> I, I'm really excited about it. So today, our main discussion is going to focus on winter and holiday reads. And I think ultimately we've chosen, we've all chosen ones that relate to a holiday that happens in the winter season. So I know mine is for Christmas. I think Sarah, yours is Christmassy as well. Mm -hmm. And Jen, yours is focused more on the new year. So right. we do all have them somewhat related to winter holidays here. And yeah, we just wanted to share this with you. We know that some of you love doing mood reading. And so it's always fun to make recommendations related to that for those of you who are fans of that. And again, right here at the start of December is a fun time to think about some things you could read this winter. So Jen, what's your recommendation? So I'm recommending a book I read back in March, and this is Sophie Cousins' This Time Next Year. I read it as a buddy read with the Chicklet Book Club, and we had a great chat about this one. So it is about the main character is Minnie. Her name is Minnie Cooper, and <laughs> she is very bitter about her name because when she was born in 1990, her family lives in London. They were having a lot of financial problems, but there was a chance, a very good chance that Minnie would be the first baby born in the new year in 1990. And that there was a cash prize that went along with being the first baby to be born in the new year. And the one thing her parents knew was that they wanted her name to be Quinn. And while her mother was in labor, there was another woman there who was also in labor and she was very clearly wealthy, but she was having a lot of trouble coping with labor. She was having a lot of anxiety. And so Minnie's mom was talking her through it and just, you know, trying to talk about anything to get her mind off of it. And she shared the name that she had chosen and was trying to get the other mom to talk about the names that she had chosen. And so what happens is the wealthy mother has her baby first and names him Quinn. And so Minnie's mom is furious, both because of the loss of this cash prize that would really be life-changing for her family and because she stole her name. And now she feels like she can't name her kid Quinn even, you know, even though that had been the, the name that she had chosen for years and years and years. And so she, she names her Minnie instead. And so you can <laughs> see why Minnie is bitter. So because of this, Minnie is convinced that every New Year's is bad luck, that something bad happens to her. And she has evidence to bear that out. There are a lot of horrible things through the course of her life that have happened on this date. The present day of the book it happens at this New Year's Eve party where Minnie ends up meeting Quinn and eventually, of course, realizes which Quinn it is and what he had stolen from her. <laughs> and then the book moves back and forth, forth in time on different New Year's, on different New Year's Eves. And we see that they have almost met a number of times before. And you see the way that this bitterness and this feeling that something was stolen from her family has really been a shadow over Minnie's life and over her family's life. And it feels like this very small thing, but it's this thing that they keep returning to as this might have been. Minnie's dad is really, really sweet, but he is constantly chasing these big dreams that never pan out. And so her mom is very bitter about that. She feels as if he would just settle down and choose one thing that their life could be improved. Minnie has started a bakery where she bakes pies. This is in London. So these aren't like fruit pies. These are like meal pies. And she delivers them to older people who need them. And then she and the people who work it with her 
spend time with the older people. It's really sweet. She opened this business with her best friends and it's their dream and they're going to make it big. And then at some point, Minnie realizes how much her best friend has sacrificed to make Minnie's dream happen. So there's a lot of, there is a lot of romance here, but there's also a lot about Minnie's relationship with her friend. There's a lot of consideration of friendship and of what it takes to be a good friend. There's a lot of great content about her family. And then we also do see Quinn's family and his side. And we find out that his mom, the anxiety she was experiencing that night has been something she's dealt with throughout her life and that he has in some ways had to be very strong for her and that there were parts of his childhood that he missed because he was, his dad ended up leaving her and he was the person who helped her through everything, helped her through her anxious times, helped her through his dad leaving. So it's one of those romances. I I would say it's lighthearted and it is, and it has a lot of really sweet parts, but there is some serious content to balance that out. So yeah, that is kind of a rambling (laughs) summary. It's hard because it doesn't, it's not straightforward from beginning to end. It's been compared to One Day in December by Mm. Josie Silver. Yeah. Because that one sort of revisits the same couple on multiple days. But that one, as far as I remember, was strictly chronological, wasn't it? Did it just, did it always move forward? Yeah. Yeah. It it always moved forward. Yeah. I I I actually thought about using that one for this episode. (laughs) Yeah, that was a really good one. And I do think there are certain elements in common. I liked the back and forth because what it allowed cousins to do is to emphasize certain themes because she would have the thing happening in the present and then it would flash back to the new years they would emphasize what had kind of led Quinn or Minnie to to the way they are now so yeah I think it's a really great read to think about moving forward and the new year and a fresh start and it's really really sweet so that is Sophie Cousins's this time next year I have that on my list huh, that sounds great Jen yeah, I, I don't think I've heard of that one. Or, I, you know, I'm sure that I had seen posts somewhat, but it wasn't really on my radar. But that really sounds lovely. It's one of those that has two very different covers. And I feel like one is much more memorable than the other. And the more unmemorable one is the one I see most often on Bookstagram for whatever reason. It's a very strange phenomenon. Y'all, you'll have to look. So, Sarah, what's your pick? My pick is Jasmine Guillory's Royal Holiday, and I have read several of Jasmine Guillory's other books. I really love The Wedding Date. That's probably my favorite one that I've read of her collection. And what I love about her books is that she, we revisit the same characters, but you don't necessarily have to read her books in order. And so I read The Wedding Date and I read The Proposal, but I haven't read all of the, all of the books in her in her series, but this is number four in the wedding date series. And like I said, it's Royal holiday. And this is perfect for this season because it's pretty short. It's a super quick read. The audio is only six hours and 50 minutes. And so you can get through it really quickly. And I felt like it was a really straightforward story, but I just really loved the characters. The main character is Vivian Forrest. She is going with her daughter, Maddie to England. Maddie is a stylist and she is styling a duchess. And so they go for Maddie to do all this work with the duchess and style her for some of the holiday events that are happening. And so Vivian goes with her daughter. So they are going to spend Christmas in England. And Vivian meets Malcolm Hudson, the private kind of secretary for the queen and they have a little spark. And like I said, it's pretty straightforward. They have a spark. They start finding out about each other. And the question throughout the book is, will they have a relationship outside of this vacation or will they not? And I'm not going to spoil it, (laughs) (laughs) but it is a holiday book just so you know, but it's just, I mean, it's really, I really like it because it focuses on, Two older adults who are in the, who are both divorced. They have been on their own a long time. They are thinking that that probably like love is not 
you know, going to happen again for them. And then they meet and it's just a really sweet story about them finding each other and finding out about each other. And there are some little things that come up along the way, but I just thought it was really fun. And I loved the setting of England. And there were some really funny parts. There's a scene with horseback riding that is really sweet and funny. And I just loved it. I, I think Jasmine Guillory does a great job of just writing really likable and approachable characters. And you really root for them, even if they're flawed. And I just really loved it. I thought it was a great read for the holiday season because it's quick, it's joyful, and the characters are just so lovely. So that is Jasmine Guillory's Royal Holiday. I really liked that one too. I've liked all of hers. And like you said, I've liked some more than others, but I think it's like with any romance series. I love that sense of these familiar characters and I love trying to figure out which character is going to be the connecting thread with the other ones. And yeah, they're really, they're really great. Yeah, I didn't know much about that, Sarah. So I had been interested in reading that one and I've seen a lot about it, but I didn't realize that it featured an older couple, which I think is really neat. So yes, I really like that part about it. Ashley, what is your pick? So this is one that was definitely influenced by Bookstagram and by Jen. Sarah, have you read this? I read The Tourist Attraction and then I have not read Mistletoe Mr. Wright. I started, actually started that back in the summer because my library had it off. Because a lot, like a lot of times during the holidays, these books are are already checked out but I started reading it I'm like "Mm, I think I need to wait till a little bit cooler because it felt weird like in July (laughs) listening to it so I just I decided to wait because I like the holiday reads I like the mood reading but I, I really enjoyed the tourist attraction I thought it was great yeah so this is Sarah Morgenthaler's Mistletoe and Mr. Wright and like I said I was influenced by Jen, uh, and also by Bookstagram for Sarah Morgenthaler in general. And I think Sarah and I both read The Tourist Attraction in pretty yes. close proximity <laughs> because we had had some positive influences about how great her romances are. So yeah, I was really happy to return to the community in Alaska. And this one focuses on Lana, who is, and Rick, and they are two characters who are important in The Tourist Attraction, but especially Lana, but, you know, this is a companion piece. So they could be read this one and had not read the tourist attraction. No problem. They are not sequential in that sense. And so I absolutely loved this. I do think it is perfect for the holidays. It features a lot of very cute and sometimes curmudgeonly animals, which I am 100% (laughs) here for. So (laughs) I really enjoyed that part of it. And I think that I've said this before about the tourist attraction that what I really like is like the setting of the small town in Alaska. I think that part is really well done. And what I love is the tension as far as tourism and how it is a necessary part of some small town survival. And yet it also is off putting for a lot of people who are the local population in a town and so we really see that tension and that is explored a lot in this book so lana's family is the montgomery corporation and they own a tremendous amount of places they own a lot of real estate around the world and they have tons of money and so lana has bought up a lot of properties in moose springs and she's done that for a really good reason and yet everybody in the town hates her for it. And so I think all of that plays out really well in the sense that it's believable on both sides. It's believable that her heart is in the right place and that she really wants to save the town in a lot of ways. So it's a town that if they don't make some substantial changes, they will not have the economy to continue to support you know, the next generation basically. And so they really are gonna have to make some changes in order to keep to keep their economy growing and keep Moose Springs in good enough shape to support the local economy. So like that is her mindset, but you know, she's coming in from outside. She has bazillions of dollars and she is viewed as being part of the tourist problem. And so she, you know, lives at the resort up there when she's in town. And, you know, all of that is like, they're up on the hill. They, I mean, it's all the, it's all the things that just have a really negative connotation. And so 
Lana loves the town, has a special place in her heart for it, whereas the townspeople absolutely hate her, but she kind of good-naturedly tolerates that and is just agreeable about it generally. But she is really lonely. She is really having to expend a lot of energy to put up the front that she is happy with the way that things are, even though everyone is kind of going out of their way to do mean things to her. And so, you know, the, she's got this kind of facade and then the reality of how hard it is. And meanwhile, her family does not support the decision that she has made to invest in New Springs. So her family, who has a lot of sway also, and who is part of the business, they all are kind of working against her as far as navigating this real estate purchase and the decisions that she made related to the town. So she's also navigating that. So there's a lot of things that she is kind of holding in while trying to navigate the holidays in Moose Springs. And so I think all of that I found really interesting. And then Rick is the pool hall owner in town. And he is part of where we see a lot of the really cute and curmudgeonly animals. <laughs> and we just get a sense of him as somebody who has such a kind heart and who takes in the, the animals and the people who maybe need some extra love. And he finds a way forward with that. And so we see that he lives with his nephew who is a grumpy young adult. And we find out that like his nephew has experienced tragedy that also touched on Rick's life and that like that's how they wound up together. But, you know, in the very beginning, we see that Rick has come home without the milk and Diego, his nephew, is really upset because they need milk because they eat cereal every night of their lives. So it's definitely like this like bachelor situation for their home life. But then he also has this like, tiny little hedgehog that's very cute and this very grumpy, <laughs> and this very grumpy cat who is his ex his ex-wife's cat that he now takes care of who I mean is very grumpy and so you know you see this side of him that's that is endearing and we start to see how those things evolve and I thought it was just really sweet and that Lana and Rick one of the things I liked that I thought was different than a lot of romances I've read is that we can tell that they really care for each other right away and that they both know that. And yet, for all the reasons I've already said, there are some complications with them having a relationship. And so like those are the things that they're working through. And so it's not a lot of the tropes that I have read with romance have relied more on the characters being kind of opposing. So like the enemies to lovers kind of stuff. And like here, it's much more these external factors that are impacting both of them and that really make things complicated. And so I thought all that worked really well, but I absolutely, I mean, I loved it. And I do think it is perfect for the holidays because it is a lot of that I mean, you see a lot of holiday events and it's also just like, what does it mean if you don't have a home for the holidays and like, how does that feel and how do we create home and how do we have that at a time when we want to be connected to people? I think you really see all of that here too. So again, that is Sarah Morgenthaler's Mistletoe and Mr. Right. And I think it would be a great pick for this season. I love that one. I can't wait yeah. to read that. <laughs> oh, Sarah, it is right up your alley. Yeah, yes. you're going to love it. Yeah, you'll have to report back, Sarah. You, I definitely, will. <laughs> you can put it in this month, I feel sure, and uh -huh. let us know. But I mean, I for me, I don't know if this was true for you, Gemma. I enjoyed it even more than the tourist attraction. So it was really good. I did good. too. Yeah. It's really yeah. good. Well, we hope that those recommendations left you with something to enjoy this winter season and this holiday season. And we want to finish with something that is consistent with the theme here and talk about for our Give Me One, a favorite seasonal drink. So Sarah, what is a favorite seasonal drink for you? Well, I wasn't sure when I saw this on our planning sheet, if it was a like drink drink for grownups or if it were it was just a beverage so I picked two because I can <laughs> and so the first <laughs> one is for grownups I picked mulled wine because it's spicy and tasty and you can sit beside of the the fire and sip it 
And so that's my like adult drink that I like. And then for my drink for all, I love Mexican hot chocolate. I had never had that. And then a long time ago, right before I got married, I was in New York for in the winter with some friends and we had Mexican hot chocolate at a hot chocolate place and I fell in love with it and I think it is delicious. I love things that have cinnamon and spice to them. And so pair that with chocolate, a thick, like yummy chocolate, and I'm here for that. So those are my two. Nice. Yeah. Those sound good. Those do sound good. What about you, Jen? What's your pick? So mine is very driven by memories. So my choice is eggnog. And that is because my grandma loved eggnog. And no one else in my family likes it. So that was this thing that I was so proud that I liked too. And every year, I mean, I'm talking like straight out of the carton eggnog, nothing fancy, nothing alcoholic, just like, yeah, it, as mundane as you can get. But every time I have it, it just brings back those memories of this thing I shared with my grandma. So that's my pick. Sweet. How about you, Ashley? I chose Irish cream. I feel like I would like that any time, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it is one that I, we mostly have beer and wine now at this stage in our life, if we're going to have alcohol. And so it is something that I just enjoy right around the holiday season. And I like it in hot drinks, but also just like a little bit over ice. I really like that too, but I have started just in the last couple of years. That's something that I enjoy doing around the holidays and just enjoy that and think of it as being seasonal to the holidays. But yeah, Sarah, you were saying about the Mexican hot chocolate. We are in Madrid. We're enjoying a lot of churros and chocolate. And that is definitely not, we're enjoying it the whole season of living here. <laughs> so, so not specific to just in the winter, but yeah, that has been a really delicious treat here. So mm, that sounds delicious right now. <laughs> <laughs> You got it. It's always a good time for it. <laughs> well, thank you listeners so much for joining us today. We would love to hear about your picks for winter reads and holiday reads and ways that you celebrate the season and the winter and things that you enjoy drinking and just that make things feel festive for you. So thanks for joining us and we look forward to connecting soon. Do you have comments or opinions about what you heard today? We'd love to hear them. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Unabridged Pod or on the web at unabridgedpod.com for ways to support us. To get more involved, you can sign up for our newsletter, join a buddy read, or become an ambassador. Thanks for listening to Unabridged.